Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Hai Macedo from the James Watt School of Engineering and today I want to talk to you a little bit about quantum technologies. Um, quantum technologies are a big part of the research that we do at the Electronics and Nanoscale Engineering Research Division, but it is also a big part of our curriculum within the Electronics and Electrical Engineering discipline. And in particular, I do teach a course called Quantum Electronic Devices. So what are quantum technologies? Let's start with that, right? So if you've seen any sci-fi movies recently, you might have heard people referring to things such as quantum realm, quantum fields, or even a lot of gadgets that are said to be enabled by quantum physics to achieve something quite extraordinary that you wouldn't see in everyday life. For example, you might have seen people talking about teleportation, which is where you take someone from a position in space and then they disappear there and immediately reappear in a completely different location. But quantum physics as a theory is quite young actually, only over a hundred years old. And if you think about it, this university is over 500 years old. So for something to have started only a hundred years ago, I'd say it's quite young. But the initial ideas, such as, for example, describing how electrons and charges travel inside of material, have already given us very interesting and important devices that we have today and that enable more than electronics, like the transistor, which basically tells every smartphone computer when to let electricity through or not and process information. We also got the laser, which if you think about it, um, is now everywhere from the shops in the barcode scanners to medical procedures such as laser eye surgery. So it would be fair of me to say that quantum technologies have already somehow enabled other technologies in the last century. But while it gave us these really interesting ideas and really useful ideas, it also has given us some crazy ideas as well. For example, there is a concept in quantum mechanics called superposition, which basically says that a quantum particle could be in two places at once or in two states at the same time. You may have even heard of a very famous cat, which is both dead and alive at the same time. So because of, you know, these really crazy concepts such as superpositions, this is why probably you can find these ideas very easily in sci-fi because, you know, it can make something quite crazy sound almost believable. But these ideas, these more out there ideas, haven't really been harnessed in any technological devices that we use today. And this is the point of quantum technologies and where quantum technologies are at just now, is trying to get those ideas from theory and build them into actual devices that we can use in everyday life. So let's take a closer look at superposition. That is what enables quantum bits or qubits, which are the most basic unit of quantum information processing. Right. These are quite similar to what we have in our electronics today, which are the classical bits. And classical bits work by creating sequences of zeros and ones, depending on what you want to do or send to someone. For example, if you want to send an emoji or a picture on your phone, your phone will then generate a sequence of zeros and ones, storing either zero or one in a bit. Qubits are different in that they can have both zeros and ones at the same time because of superposition. So you could think about it as a coin toss, right? If you toss a coin and you look at the result, it's either heads or tails. It can only be one of them. But in a qubit, it would be equivalent of tossing the coin and having it up in the air, flipping, where you don't know whether it is zero or one. It could be either zero or one. It could be both. You just don't know until you have a look, which we call making a measurement. So that state of having both zeros and ones is what we use to perform at quantum information exchange and processing, right? So you can think about it, once you start putting all of these qubits together, you have the potential to be millions of times faster than classical computation. Because in classical computers, the power of your computer scales with how many bits you have. So if you want to send large images, you need to have as many bits to perform that information. Whereas in quantum computers, you technically wouldn't need to have as many qubits because you can store these two states at the same time. But you do need something else from quantum mechanics to enable this though, 
And this is the concept of entanglement. Entanglement pretty much says that if you have two quantum particles or two quantum things, they can be connected in such a way that if you gain information about one of them, you automatically gain information about the other. So imagine two coin tosses this time. If you learn what the state of one of these coins is, you would immediately know what the state of the other coin is. Now, it doesn't really make sense when you talk about coins because there is no connection between them. But that is the beauty of quantum physics, is the quantum connection between them that allows us to gain this information. And that is what is called entanglement. So now imagine we already know that qubits can be in two states at the same time. So if you put them together and they are all connected through this entanglement and by measuring one, by gaining information about one, you automatically gain information about the other. That is what then allows us to have this exponential growth in computational power, which we don't get in classical computation. So why do we want to do this? Why is this important? Well, while our conventional computer is really powerful for what we do on our everyday life, there are still some problems that our computers can't solve. For example, if you think about drug discovery, which you need to model how you know artificial chemicals interact with chemicals in our bodies, and you have billions of atoms and particles, that's a very difficult problem that our classical computers would take billions of years to solve. In quantum computers, we could solve that much, much, much faster. Um, but there are other things that are also expected to have a profound impact by quantum computation, such as stock markets, banking, and so on. So how do we create these quantum technologies or even a qubit? How do we make one of them? So there is various ways to do that. For example, if you just use a photon or just light and the polarization of light, um, you could create qubits that way. You could create qubits using spins inside of materials. For example, if you think of bar magnets, which as act as a spins and you have north and north and south and their interaction. So the quantum version of that, the spins inside of the material that give rise to, you know, magnetism, um, we could use that as well. But one of the main ways um, at the moment of creating qubits is using superconducting materials. Superconducting materials are materials which below very, very low temperatures, temperatures that are close to the temperatures of outer space. Um, they become um, highly conductor. Basically, they just let out electricity or electrons move through them freely. So you can create very, very small structures, nanostructures out of these superconductors, and then they behave as qubits, which is essentially a true state system uh, that can be put into superposition. But as I said, the temperatures that you need to create these things are very, very cold, outer space kind of temperatures. So then we get a problem, which is how do we control them? How do we put them into those temperatures? And how do we control them? One way that is used by um, quantum computing leaders such as IBM, Google, is to use something called a dilution refrigerator. And this is something that we also use here at the University of Glasgow in the Advanced Research Centre for our research on quantum technologies. So the way that it works is different phases of helium are pumped in the system and the dilution. So if you think of each phase of helium being a different liquid, they are already very, very cold. But when they try to combine themselves with each other, then they absorb heat from the environment. So by pumping that dilution through the system, it will absorb heat from the environment and will generate these ultra low temperatures. This is done by levels. For example, if you look at this level here, the temperature would be about 77 Kelvin. And then as you go to the next level down, then you are at four Kelvin. And then you get one Kelvin at this lower level. And then we are down at 100 millikelvin. And finally, at the very bottom, where we have our samples and our qubit, we are at 26 millikelvin, about 100 times colder than outer space. And that's the temperature that we achieve here at the bottom of our dilution refrigerator and where we put our qubits. So once we cool it down to those very, very low temperatures and we have the qubit in a superconducting state, 
and is acting as a quantum particle, has those states and can be put in superposition. Um, we can then control it, send some signals that can change the state. Um, but we can also check how it's doing in time, because a part of computation anywhere is to make sure that it's reliable, that, you know, as time goes on, the state doesn't change, the state of your bit remains the same, which means the information that you're trying to send remains the same. So these are things that we are still studying, they're still ongoing in the field of quantum technologies and quantum computation. But we have looked a lot at the hardware and what a quantum computer might look like. But what about software? A computer is not just the machine, right? There is all of the software that goes into it. How do you code? How do you design software for a quantum computer? Well, again, we have an issue because we have to deal with those quantum phenomena and quantum rules that are quite different from what we have in our classical computers. For example, you cannot copy quantum information or you can't copy the state of a qubit into another qubit as we do with classical bits. So what you have to do here is once you put two qubits in superposition, you can then use a concept very much from sci-fi. If you remember when I was talking about um, teleportation, you can teleport in various movies, someone from one place in space into another almost immediately. Well, if you, you get two quantum bits and you entangle them, because of that property of accessing states from different quantum particles through the other, if they are entangled, you could then transfer the information from one into the other in a process that we call teleportation, where your information from this qubit is destroyed and immediately reappears into another. The beauty of this is that these qubits don't necessarily need to be next to each other for entanglement to take place. You could have them separated kilometers apart. People have tested recently hundreds of miles of space between qubits and they still preserve entanglement. The information is still transferred from one into the other. The thing about this is, it can also enable other functionalities into quantum technologies. For example, if you think about this property of you cannot copy information or you cannot clone quantum information, that would be very useful for security. For example, if someone wants to spy on your bank account, if that information is being transferred across a quantum channel, they wouldn't be able to do that without you knowing. This property would make quantum networks a lot more secure than the networks that we have now to transfer information across various channels. Okay, well, that was me. And if you are interested in quantum technologies, come to the University of Glasgow. We have several degree programs that you might be interested in, where you either study quantum technologies for its entirety, or you might want to take some topics as a part of your program. And I hope to see you in class. Thank you for watching.